Welcome. Today we're going to talk about blood. We're in the cardiovascular system and we're going to look at the um, parts of the cardiovascular system. First we're going to look at the blood and then we'll go into heart anatomy. So I'm going to go into our course here and look in the correct folder. We're in the lab folder and we don't have um, any specific lab notes for you as a separate document because I did include notes under each slide in the blood folder. So if we open up the folder on blood, look at this PowerPoint here. It'll open up here in just a minute. If you go to um, view and slide over to notes pages, you'll see that it brings up a box underneath each slide and in that box I have the written information for each slide that will help you better understand what to look for with each of these cells. So just look in that area underneath each slide. When you pull up a PowerPoint in the traditional view those notes pages don't show up so you do have to go click on view and click notes pages. But to present today I'm going to just view this in the normal way so you can see these pictures a little larger. So we're going to just go like that. All right, so starting looking at the blood. Here we see a vial of blood that has been drawn from a vein in the arm, and then it's been spun down in this centrifuge. And when we spin blood down, the heavier components settle to the bottom of the tube, and the lighter components are on the top of the tube. So this uh, liquid portion of the blood is called the plasma, and it's about 55% of our blood is plasma. So it's the liquid part of our blood. It has lots of important um, chemicals and molecules dissolved in it, so it is important, even though it's 90% water, um, it contains a lot of other important things for homeostasis. And we'll talk about that in the lecture portion of our course. So the plasma is a liquid portion of our blood. It has a yellowish straw colored appearance to it and it makes up 55% of our whole blood. And then the bottom portion here we see is red, and that's because it's made of, of strictly red blood cells. So 45% of our blood is red blood, are red blood cells. And these are solid components of blood. It's just individual red blood cells that are set, settled down here to the bottom of the uh, test tube. In the middle is this thin white layer called the Buffy coat. And the Buffy coat contains white blood cells and platelets. Notice that it makes up only less than 1% of our blood, but it's very important for our immune function and for stopping bleeding when we're talking about platelets. So we have the plasma, 55%. We have the red blood cells, otherwise called erythrocytes. And then we have the Buffy coat made up of white blood cells and platelets. So you do have to know what each component is called and what percent they make up of whole blood. So if we look at a smear or a slide of blood on you know, through a microscope, we can see all these red blood cells here in the background. Because we know 45% of our blood, almost half of our blood is made up of red blood cells, we would expect to see a lot of those cells on the slide. So we can see that here. Notice that they have pale centers. That's because red blood cells, otherwise called erythrocytes, do not have a nucleus once they are mature. So they are uh, pale in the center and they're actually thinner in the center as well because of that not having a nucleus. We can see these other larger cells here. These are white blood cells and these cells do have a visible nucleus and based on the shape of that nucleus we can identify different wet red or, I'm sorry, different white blood cells from one another. So we're going to look at each individual white blood cell and I'll tell you some characteristics about each so you can identify them from each other. Here we see platelets scattered on the slide in a little cluster here. Um, these are fragments of cells. So those are very unique, very easy to identify because they just look like broken bits or pieces of a cell. So the first cell we're going to look at are called neutrophils. And neutrophils are unique in that they have this multi-lobed nucleus. So you can see that all of these different slides here showing neutrophils are all the same in that we see that multi-lobed nucleus. And these are very active when we have an acute infection. For example, you cut yourself and you have a little bacteria invading that area. These are the first ones on the scene to phagocytose or eat up those bacterial cells and other debris in the infected area. 
Lymphocytes are the smallest of the white blood cells, and they're also the least numerous, and these are also known as T cells and B cells. So these are important for antibody production and for mediating an immune response. So how we can identify these cells on the slide is we're looking for smaller cells. They're almost close to the size of a red blood cell, not too far off, so that's kind of a distinguishing feature. And also they have this large round or oval nucleus. Notice there's pale cytoplasm that we can see around the edge of that nucleus, so it's a very large nucleus, but there's a little bit of cytoplasm that's visible. And it's a very large, round, smooth nucleus. That is characteristic of the lymphocytes. So these are important when someone is fighting a, um, an infection, or they are decreased in number when we're looking at someone, for example, who is getting chemotherapy and treatment for killing cells, and sometimes the white blood cells, unfortunately, are decreased in number. Um, so we would see that in general um, of white blood cells, or um, someone who has AIDS. That's where the virus, the HIV virus, attacks the T cells and destroys those cells. But as long as someone is simply HIV positive, their T cells are still intact and they're not reducing a number. It's not until they get into the full-blown AIDS with all of its associated symptoms that we see a significant reduction in the number of T cells. Monocytes are the largest of the white blood cells. They too have a pale cytoplasm just like the lymphocytes do, but they're going to have a U-shaped or kidney bean-shaped nucleus. So we can see each of these monocytes here have that characteristic to their nucleus, being U-shaped or kidney bean-shaped. And these cells um, circulate through the blood, but they can actually leave the blood through the holes in the capillaries or spaces between the cells that line the capillary and fight infection out in the tissue. When they leave the blood and enter the tissues, we call them macrophages, and those um, are also phagocytes like the neutrophils. And these are popular um, when someone has a long-term infection, like if someone is fighting tuberculosis or um, Lyme's disease, we would see um, the, a lot of these monocytes in the blood. Eosinophils, these are popular uh, cells that help fight parasitic worms. They also uh, play a role in people with allergies. We see higher numbers of these cells. What's characteristic about these cells is they have a red cytoplasm. So when we stain these cells, those, uh, that cytoplasm, there's granules in the cytoplasm that stains red. So look for that red color. And that's the eosinophils. People look at that word and think it's kind of difficult to pronounce, but it really isn't if you just say the first two letters, E-O, sin, O, fills, eosinophils. The last set of white blood cells you have to know are the basophils. The basophils are smaller cells. Some students confuse them with lymphocytes, but what's characteristic of the basophils are these dark granules found throughout the cytoplasm, and they're so dark and so numerous they actually crowd out our view of the nucleus. So look for these granules throughout the cytoplasm and difficult to distinguish a nucleus there. That's very different from the lymphocytes where we have a visible round smooth nucleus. And these are also involved in people with allergies. Um, they produce a couple of different chemicals that we see in the allergic reaction and one of those is histamine. And they also produce some anticoagulant chemicals such as heparin. But for lab you only need to identify these. You don't need to know their function. Just know their their physical characteristics based on their nucleus or the color or um, um, presence of granules. Lastly, the platelets. These are little fragments of cells. So here we can see three platelets that have been ca captured on this slide, just small little bits of cells. Think of when you take a plate and you throw it on the ground, it breaks up into tiny little pieces. That's where the word platelet comes from. So that concludes our lab on the blood. Uh, be sure that you go maybe make flashcards of this PowerPoint and quiz yourself. See if you can identify each of the cells by looking at them without having the answer in front of you, and you'll be ready for the test.